All right, we talked about how RNA viruses make mRNA and genomes last time, all right? Today we're going to turn to DNA viruses, and here we just have to concern with making more genomes, because <coughs> making messages from a DNA virus is a totally different process, which we will take up after the uh, exam. So here are the viruses we're going to work on today. Uh, we're going to look at viruses with single-stranded DNA genomes, and we're going to look at viruses with double-stranded DNA genomes. We're not going to talk about the, the gapped ones. That we'll, we'll talk about that in another lecture. So we're going to talk about how parvoviruses and some of these viruses here uh, replicate their genomes to make new progeny, because obviously a virus infects the cell. It wants to make, it needs to make more progeny. It has to replicate its genome. So we're going to talk about adenoviruses, herpes viruses, polyomaviruses, and the highly related papillomaviruses and uh, pox viruses. Now, if you remember the rules for RNA synthesis, this is almost they're almost the same for <coughs> DNA synthesis. You have the same uh, type of template up here, except it's DNA, of course, instead of RNA. And we're showing a primer with, with triphosphates added at the 3' prime hydroxyl. So again, uh, the DNA is made in a template-directed incorporation uh, into the 3' prime hydroxy end of the DNA chain. It's always synthesized in a 5 to 3' prime direction, just like RNA. The template is read in a 3 to 5' prime direction. So that can be confusing. And uh, it's via semi-conservative replication. You should know what this is, but if you don't, it's take a double strand of DNA, and each strand is going to be copied. So you're going to have two daughter strands, all right, instead of just having one, which would be conservative replication. Replication initiates at specific sites called origins. This is a very important word, origins, because we're going to talk about that a lot today. DNA is catalyzed by DNA-dependent DNA polymerase and other proteins. You need a lot of other proteins, more than for RNA. I don't want you to know the names of them. You just need to know that there's a lot of them and that sometimes the virus can supply them. DNA replication is always primer dependent. So this is different from RNA replication or RNA synthesis, which may or may not be primer dependent. So those are our rules. The DNA polymerase looks a lot like the RNA polymerase that we looked at last time. Here's, here's poliovirus RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Remember, I said it looks like a right hand with thumb and fingers and a palm domain, and the palm domain is the active site. That's where everything happens. That's where the nucleotides are added to the growing chain. And you can see here's a DNA polymerase structure. Uh, and here is, here is uh, the thumb and the fingers and the palm domain. It's colored the same yellow here as it was in the RNA polymerase. And you may remember that in that active site, these two uh, beta strands in yellow are the main part of the active site. There are two aspartate residues there that coordinate magnesium metals to help add the bases. Same thing happens in DNA polymerases. There are two aspartate residues there. They coordinate magnesium. In fact, this scheme that I showed you last time is actually for DNA, the two metal mechanism of addition uh, of triphosphates to a growing chain. So again, the DNA template is shown here, and the bases are added according to the complementation rules, and they are coordinated. They're held in place by the two magnesiums as the polymerase catalyzes the addition of the phosphate to the end of the growing chain. So very similar to RNA synthesis. So what is, you know, DNA viruses, what do they need the host for? Well, the, the viruses can't do it all. Some of them can, but most of the ones we'll talk about cannot replicate DNA by themselves. For all the viruses that we'll talk about, DNA replication always requires the synthesis of at least one viral protein. So we'll, give, we'll talk about an example where one viral protein needs to be made, and that's, that's enough to catalyze DNA synthesis. Other viruses ma make many. So DNA synthesis is always delayed. Just think of this. Even if the virus is <laughs> double-stranded DNA, the DNA, in most cases, with one exception, which we'll talk about, has to go to the nucleus. To make a protein, you have to make mRNA from the DNA. It has to get out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. It has to be translated. So DNA synthesis is always delayed. It always happens later, and it always happens when at least one viral protein is made. 
We'll talk about some simple viruses, which means they have small genomes, they're in small particles. They don't have a lot of coding region for extra proteins. Typically, they have capsid, the simplest viruses have a couple of capsid proteins and one or two proteins that go towards DNA synthesis. And that's it, they don't have room for anything else. It's called genetic economy. They can only carry the most essential genes. So they use the rest from the host. But there are complex viruses that encode many, mostly, uh, not all of them, the adenoviruses and the herpes viruses don't encode all the proteins you need. But pox virus, which is the biggest virus we'll talk about today, has everything it needs. Seems to encode every protein that it needs to replicate its DNA. And you can remember this by the fact that these viruses replicate in the cytoplasm. It's the only DNA virus we'll talk about that can multiply in the cytoplasm. And think, in the cytoplasm, the cell doesn't keep any DNA-related enzymes, not needed, they would be in the nucleus. So this virus has to encode everything it needs to replicate its genome. Now those big, big viruses we talked about, the Mimi viruses and the Pandoras, they probably also replicate in the cytoplasm, but we're, we're not talking about those, mainly because we don't know very much about how all of that works. So the polymerase for some of these viruses, it comes from the host cell. So small DNA viruses, as I said, they don't have an entire replication system. They encode at least one protein that orchestrates the host. I like that word. They, they distract the host from replicating its own DNA to theirs. It's like, hey, I'm, very, I'm a very nice DNA molecule, make more of me. And these are papillomaviruses, polyomavirus, and, and parvoviruses. We'll talk mostly about the polyomas and the parvoviruses today. The large DNA viruses have a lot more room. They can encode more proteins, so they have more uh, of their replication system. Herpes viruses, adenoviruses, and pox viruses. And we'll talk about those uh, today as well. Uh, so some of the viral proteins that you will see uh, and I will have names for them on other slides, but you don't need to remember the names. There are DNA polymerases and accessory proteins. There are origin binding proteins. There are helicases which unwind double-stranded DNAs. They have to be unwound in order to be copied, just like mRNA has to be unwound. Uh, double-stranded RNA would have to be unwound for it to be copied. There are exonucleases that chop ends. Uh, and there are various enzymes of nucleic acid metabolism. Remember all the DNTPs, they have to be made and there are lots of enzymes in the cell that go towards that. So for, again, for the small viruses, this is all coded by the cell. But some of the bigger viruses encode these enzymes that have to do with uh, nucleotide metabolism. Okay, so let's take a little quiz here. statement is not correct, not correct. Right, number two is correct. We have some <coughs> stragglers here. Let's see what we're doing. All right, which is not correct. So large DNA viruses encode many proteins. That's correct. Uh, I, you have to take my word for it, but I just told you that. That's part of the reason they're bigger. Small DNA viruses do not encode any proteins involved in DNA synthesis. All viruses encode at least one. So this is incorrect. Viral DNA replication is always delayed after infection because it requires the synthesis of at least one viral protein. That's correct also. So uh, it is number two. All right. All right, so these are the genomes we'll talk about today. Just like last time when we talked about RNA replication, I wanted to show you how each different configuration works, plus-stranded, minus-stranded, one molecule segmented. These are the different configurations that DNAs come in quite diverse, and we'll talk about how each of these is replicated. We start here with our parvoviruses, rather small, single-stranded DNA genomes. They're linear. The ends can form these interesting, called T-structures. They're just basically base pairing between the ends, and we'll see how that works. And we have the polyomaviruses, double-stranded circles, pretty small also. Related to these are the papillomaviruses. In fact, they used to be in the same family until we realize they're quite different. So we will talk a little bit about papillomaviruses. They're very important viruses. In fact, both families infect most of us. And the papillomaviruses uh, are causative agents of warts and can cause 
cervical cancers. We'll talk about those later. Herpes viruses now uh, much bigger, 120 <coughs> to 220 kilobase pairs, really, really much bigger. Dover stranded linear DNA. Adenoviruses, 38, 36 to 48 kilobase pairs. I don't want you to know how long these are. Don't even bother to memorize it, okay? That's not the point. The point is bigger genomes can encode more proteins. So a principle here would be, what do you get from having a bigger genome? You can encode more of your DNA replication machinery, okay? What's the point of telling your patient that polyomas, which you're infected with, is five kilobases? You don't need to know that. And finally, pox viruses, 130 to 375 kilobase pairs. These were all double-stranded. And this one, these are unusual because the ends are actually covalently linked. The five prime and three prime ends at each end are, are bonded. So if you denatured this, it would be a single-stranded circle. So these are different uh, kinds of topologies. So we have to figure out how to replicate all of them with a DNA polymerase that's more or less the same. Now there are two main mechanisms of DNA synthesis that we know of. We don't know of any other kinds. We might know another one in 10 years, but right now we don't know any others, so I can say that. On the left are, is DNA synthesis that occurs via a replication fork. Why is it called a replication fork? It doesn't look like a fork, but it is, it is forked. Like, that's a, like a, when you reach a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> Boy, you guys are nervous about the exam, right? <laughs> Who said that? Yes, I heard Yogi Berra. He said that. When you think, reach a fork in the road, take it. So it's called a replication fork because you start with a double strand, and it's, each strand is replicated at the same time. And these are the viruses that do that. Our DNA is replicated via a replication fork. And you'll be able to tell right away which DNAs do this or not, I think. Uh, this kind of replication always requires RNA primers. Now remember, DNA replication always needs a primer. Sometimes it is RNA, uh, and sometimes it's something else, as you will see here. So replication fork, both, both strands are replicated at once. And you can see right away this is a bit of a problem because on one <laughs> strand the synthesis is going in one direction, and in the other, it's going in the other. But the fork is growing this way, so this presents a problem, as you'll see. The other kind of DNA synthesis is strand displacement, all right? And here, basically, we're copying one strand, and the other one is being displaced. The other one's not being copied right now. It might be copied later, but at the moment, only one strand is being copied. That's why it's called strand displacement. Adenoviruses, parvos, and poxviruses do that. It's never primed with an RNA. It's always some kind of DNA or DNA protein primer. And for adeno, it's protein linked to DNA. And for the parvos and the pox viruses, it's a DNA hairpin. We'll go into this in a moment. All right, so I want you to know that there are two mechanisms of DNA synthesis. There is a replication fork and there is strand displacement. And we will talk about each of these as we go through the individual uh, replications. Now. Uh, when you replicate DNA, you have what's called the five prime end problem because as, as we saw in this replication fork, uh, on one strand we're going one way and on the other strand we're going the other. But uh, here we have a, a green RNA primer, all right? And that's gonna be removed at some point because we don't want RNA, DNA mixed together. We just want DNA. So the RNA is gonna be removed, then you have a gap. So. If you do this here on this template, you have lots of RNA primers, and these initiate the synthesis of DNA, which is shown in red. And then an enzyme comes along and takes out uh, the primers. Another DNA polymerase fills in the gaps, but here at the five prime end, can't fill it in because there's no primer anymore, <laughs> and there's a gap, and so it's just a problem. So our chromosomes, you know, have telomeres that take care of this end problem. Uh, but they, we do get shorter and shorter. That's why we get old in part. Our telomeres get shorter and shorter because of this end problem. But viruses don't have telomeres. I told you that a while ago. They have other ways to get around this. Clearly they do because they're around. So we'll see how they solve the five prime end problem. Almost everything we know about how our DNA replicates started with SV40, which is a small polyomavirus. So it's a, it's a small double-stranded circular DNA and 
you know, the fact that it was small and you could grow up virus and purify and have pure template, pure DNA template, allowed people to study DNA replication. I mean, you take DNA out of one of our cells, it's huge, it's a mess. Uh, and, and these were small and easily purifiable. And right away, people found out that this had a single origin of replication. Origin of replication is very simple. It's where DNA synthesis begins. And so uh, experiments were done to show that there was a single origin in SV40. And that allowed us to look for origins in all other sorts of genomes, including our own. So the molecule is, is circular. Uh, and um, there's a single origin. And DNA starts at that origin. And it's bidirectional. Okay, it goes in both directions. And as the growing uh, replication machinery moves along each way, you can see there's a replication fork at one end and at the other, and you get this bubble as the new D DNA is made. So the new DNA is, is shown in red. So it starts at the origin, goes in both directions, and make two, makes two replication forks. Here's a very nice experiment at the top here showing how this replication bubble grows. This is in vitro replication of SV40 DNA. And you can see it starts out very small here and grows a little bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, et cetera. So these DNAs have actually been cut after certain periods of DNA synthesis. And that way you could actually map where the origin is uh, long before we could sequence genomes. So this was proof that replication is bidirectional because you have a bubble. Yes? Are there four different polymerase molecules that work here, or is one able to do multiple strands at once? Ah, so the idea is that there's one here and there's one here, in theory. And one is actually doing leading and lagging strand. Okay, so it doesn't do, it doesn't do both strands in both directions at the same time? By both strands, you're talking about leading and lagging? Yeah. Well, you know, there are multiple polymerases doing the lagging, probably. It's, it's a difficult question. So the question is, how many polymerases are doing this? And um, the idea is that one can actually suffice at each end. It must be all coiled up so that the DNA is right near there. It's a really amazing that it works at all. So that in theory, there's one polymerase at each fork. But there may be more. It's a very difficult experiment to show. OK, so we have two replication forks, and that's the origin. So here's a little detail now of this. Um, origin. This is again the SV40 origin and we've made a replication bubble so we have our two replication forks um, and growing and this illustrates the leading and the lagging strands. So the leading strand is very easy to make. It's, you can simply start at the origin with an RNA primer that's in green and you synthesize DNA in a 5 to 3 prime direction. Uh, the problem is that the lagging strand um, you can't synthesize in the other direction. That's the wrong direction. You have to always synthesize 5 to 3 prime. So the lagging strand can only be made um, when enough of the bubble is exposed to give you some template. And then the polymerase puts down a primer, and you synthesize a piece of DNA. Then when the bubble opens up more, and the bubble is opening because of the leading strand synthesis is opening it, and the polymerases are moving to either side, then you can make another lagging, and another, and another. And the same happens here. So you have lots and lots of these small pieces, and eventually all the RNAs, uh, RNA primers are removed, and the DNAs are filled in and ligated. So th now here, uh, that, if this were a linear molecule, you'd have a 5 prime n problem. This is just a repetition of what I showed you before, this gap present after you remove the primer. SP40 solves it by being circular. There's no end. It's, it's just beautifully simple. Right, because eventually you're going to reach the other where, where replication began, and you can just move right up to that polymerase makes the DNA and, and ligate them together. So there is no end problem because the template is circular. So that's the first way you solve the five prime end problem. So let's talk a little bit about how SV40 does this. The main player that gets this going is called T antigen. This is one of the most amazing proteins in the world. It can do so many things, and it is the one protein that SV40 must make in order to start DNA synthesis. Otherwise, the cell will not see the viral DNA and will not replicate it. But once SV40 makes T antigen, which again happens because the DNA goes in the nucleus, it makes an mRNA, mRNA comes out into the cytoplasm, the protein is translated in the cytoplasm, then it has to go back into the nucleus 
where it participates in DNA replication. So large T is shown as these uh, brown uh, oblong boxes and they bind at the origin. So here's the origin of replication of SV40 and actually they make hexamers and two hexamers bind at the origin. There's very specific sequences to which large T binds. When it binds, it basically melts the origin. It melts the two strands. This is one of its most important roles. It binds to the origin, it melts the two strands, and then cellular proteins can start to recognize this as a DNA that needs to be replicated. So here's a cellular protein called RPA, replication protein A. Don't remember the name. Just remember the idea that a replication protein is now recruited to this denatured piece of DNA, probably because it binds initially to large T, and then these uh, proteins bind to single-stranded DNA, and they interact with each other. So they're basically keeping the DNA single-stranded, so the polymerase will be able to come in uh, and um, start copying it. Uh, topoisomerase 1 is a, enzyme that, another, a cellular enzyme that unwinds double-stranded DNA, so this plays a role here too. And large T also has unwinding activity. So again, large T comes in and binds the, the viral DNA specifically, and then cellular proteins needed for DNA replication are recruited to the origin via T antigen initially. So that's why this thing gets started. So here's the beginning of your replication bubble. It starts to get bigger. My, my pointer just ran out. Oh dear. Anybody have AAA batteries? What's a battery, right? Oh, it worked again. If you, if you have a pair, I'd love to have them. I'll give them back to you because I ran out. Um, so let's look at how this uh, extends a little more. So we have, uh, you have triple A's? Wow. You have, you have double A's? I have triple A's and triple A's. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know Michael, right? <laughs> Thank you, Michael. All right, so this is a slide showing you how the um, replication fork is, is uh, or the bubble is growing, and more proteins get recruited to it. That's the main point here, and they, they include what's called polymerase alpha, uh, which is going to synthesize uh, primers. DNTPs have to come in, and uh, RNTPs, of course. All right, now I'm all charged up here. All right. So uh, these, this polymerase alpha comes in, it's going to synthesize the primers, that's this guy right here, and it's going to do so on the leading, and as soon as the lagging strand is accessible, it will do, do so there. A couple of other proteins come in, uh, which make this interesting, what's called a, a sliding clamp. This basically slides along the DNA and the polymerase is on it, and that, that's what makes the whole complex move. Polymerase delta is the one that actually will make long DNA and that's happening here. So this one is coming in to make the primers, and then polymerase delta is making the longer DNAs. So right here we have the uh, leading strand being made, again, off of a primer, uh, and then we're gonna make some lagging strands uh, on the other end. Here's some lagging strands here. Again, the primer is, is Paul alpha, and delta extends them. So the leading strands are going in this way, and the lagging strands are the same direction, but they're lagging behind. And then periodically, as this bubble is growing, um, the RNA is removed by uh, RNase H and another enzyme called FEN1. Again, you don't have to know the names of these, just the idea that the RNA has to be removed. Uh, the polymerase fills in the gaps, and then a DNA ligase seals them all, and then you basically have uh, the completed DNA replication. So all this has started with large T. It wouldn't happen unless large T, large T came in there and bound to the viral RNA. So this is a, a diagram of what we think the replication machine looks like. So this is one of the two forks. And um, so you can see here there are two molecules of polymerase delta. So this is, the DNA, this is the polymerase that's making the long DNA, not the one that's making the primers. Um, here's the primase here. And so the idea is that if you loop out where the lagging strand has to occur. You could actually accomplish this by one polymerase. This is the idea that's out there, but there's no evidence for it. So here we've drawn two, one for the uh, leading strand and one for the lagging strand. There's a great movie of this on YouTube, by the way, which 
Uh, it goes so quickly that I, you can't see what's going on, but it's got a picture of this thing with the DNA zipping through and both strands being replicated. I mean, this is all wrapped up in a compact area. I mean, I just don't know how this works at all. How did, how did this ever evolve and how does it work? It's really amazing that it doesn't mess up more because it's just all squished together. So these are some of the proteins I've talked about. I'm, I don't want you to memorize them. You just need to know that there are a lot of different activities. And for SV40, the only thing SV40 encodes is T antigen. Everything else comes from the cell. Uh, this uh, RPA, the DNA polymerase alpha, that makes the primers. Uh, and these, these clamp proteins, the DNA polymerase delta, and then the enzymes that uh, take out the primers and seal the DNA. Right? So lots of proteins are coming from the cell here. Now, as you were unwinding the uh, DNA, so you, that double-stranded DNA, as you remember, has to be unwound. There are a couple of proteins I told you is involved in, are involved in that. And that's, as that's unwound, the rest of the molecule develops, uh, becomes overwound. And uh, that's bad. Eventually, this thing becomes supercoiled, and it would stop the DNA replication machine because it couldn't get past all this knotted region here. So there are are enzymes that take care of that. Topoisomerase 1 and 2, they cleave one strand as soon as it gets too overwound and uh, releases the overwinding so it can proceed. So these are part of the replication complex and I don't know how they sense when things are overwound, but when they do, they, they relax it, okay? The other thing that happens is when you're finally done replicating this whole molecule, you have a parental one in blue and a, a daughter molecule in red um, this, this isn't actually a, a correct image. They should be a blue and red strand on both. That would be semi-conservative replication. Anyway, they're intertwined. They're all, they're locked together, right? They're like two circles here. You can't get them apart unless you nick them. And then topoisomerase 2 cleaves both strands and gets them apart. Otherwise, they'd be locked together forever. So topoisomerases play an important role. And again, for SV40, these are host coded. Some of the viruses encode their own topos. Obviously, pox virus does, because it does it in the cytoplasm. All right. So this one is, this SV40 genome is a circular double-stranded DNA, which statement about its replication is correct. That's right, they are all correct. Let's have a look at that. The viral T antigen binds and unwinds the origin, absolutely. Replication is bidirectional from a single ORI, yes, two replication forks. The 5 prime N problem is solved, absolutely. Do you remember how it's solved? to circle, right? Leading and lagging strand, absolutely. So they're all correct, yes? On the this hierarchy of organisms, from viruses to humans. Who's on, to who's on top of that hierarchy? Um, <laughs> it's okay, yeah. yeah. Um, at roughly at what point do genomes start having multiple um, origins of replication? So we have some viruses that have multiple origins already. Yeah, so it starts at this low hierarchy, <laughs> low in quotes, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so these are the kind of general principles I want you to learn, okay? Not details about, you know, the names of the proteins, but what they're doing. All right, so that was SV40 with a double-stranded circular DNA. Let's take a look at parvovirus. And again, I'm showing you these different ones because they're different DNA topologies and they have different solutions. And the same, we did the same for the RNA viruses. So the parvovirus genome is single-stranded DNA. Um, it's rather small. It only encodes a couple of proteins. It has two capsid proteins and uh, a couple of proteins involved in replication, and that's it. The ends are forming these T structures. They're terminal repeats. They're actually terminal inverted repeats, and they can base pair in this manner. So here's the very three prime end of the genome. And you can see it, the sequence adjacent to that is complementary to a sequence further in in the genome. It also base pairs at the end to make this T structure, all right? This is going to be the primer for DNA synthesis, all right? So it's not going to use RNA. It's, it's using this. So it's a built-in primer, as you will see. 
All right, so here's the scheme. This looks very complicated. I would not ever ask you to write it out, so don't worry about memorizing. I want you to know what's going on here. So if I showed you one of these pictures, you could tell me what's happening, okay? We have the genome at the top, which forms these T structures at the ends, okay? Just ignore on the right here. Uh, next year, I'll, I'll take it out so you won't be distracted, but I didn't. So we have this T structure here. Now, this DNA, gets in the cell, goes in the nucleus. <coughs> the first step is that this, um, this, it looks like a gap to the cell, and the cell repairs it. So that's what this red line is. It uses, the cellular polymerase uses uh, the three prime hydroxyl in the T segment there as a primer and fills in that gap. And in so doing, it unwinds the T structure at the other end and copies all the way to the three prime end of the genome. All right, this is not technically DNA replication. We're not making more genomes. This is considered repair synthesis. And everything would stop here unless the virus made a protein. So this DNA is now transcribed. This double-stranded DNA is transcribed, and mRNA is made. It's translated to form this protein called Rep78-68. So it's a Rep protein. And this is sort of like the T antigen of SV40. It's what the virus needs to get DNA replication going. Uh, this um, rep protein has a number of activities. Uh, it can bind the, the, the DNA. It can also has a helicase and an endonuclease. So it can unwind DNA and it can nick it. So as soon as this protein is made, it goes in the nucleus and it nicks this double-stranded DNA right there. You can see the, yellow, the little yellow ball is rep 7868 right there. So it nicks the DNA and then it, un, and it can unwind it. All right, and so once it's unwound this um, T structure, the rest of the part, uh, this, this part which would be single-stranded, can now be filled in, you can see, by a polymerase. That's the red material there. So now you have a complete double-stranded copy of the original DNA. If you had stopped here, you wouldn't have the end completely copied down here. Uh, and now this um, can be a substrate for replication, for DNA polymerase. Uh, pre polymerase delta, just as we saw for SV40 and some of those sliding clamp proteins <coughs> as well. Uh, and so what happens here, uh, this, these two T structures form at the end, and that's helped by the rep protein. And then one of them serves as a primer for DNA synthesis. So now you can see new DNA being made here. It's the pink uh, DNA. This is strand displacement. So just one strand is being copied. Uh, this one is being bumped off. And the result is this top strand, which is right here. And this is basically another genomic DNA. So if we've replicated the genome by doing that. And then we have this double-stranded uh, product, which is the product of the strand displacement right here. And that can go back into this pathway. It can be nicked by Rep78, uh, extended, and copied again. All right, so that's how the virus replicates. It doesn't need Paul alpha because Paul alpha is used to synthesize RNA primers. We don't have an RNA primer here. It uses the inverted terminal repeat to self-prime. uses Paul Delta. And again, this Rep7868 is very important. It nicks, it unwinds, and binds the ends of the DNA, as you can see here. So it's strand displacement. There's no replication fork. So it's, again, a replication fork, you would have replications on both DNAs. But here, there's only one. Yes? So the primer for the strand displacement is the T structure at the end, right? Correct, right there. So what Uh, it's the same. See, A, D prime, A, B prime, A prime, D prime. Well, here, there's a C here at this loop, so this looks slightly different, all right? Uh, but the, in the end, it may be just how it's written. This is exactly the same as what we started with here. So after it's copied, this is going to be the same as this one. Even though it doesn't look like it from this uh, writing, it is the same. Well, so I guess my question is, why go through all the trouble of those steps? Yeah. Uh, why go through the trouble of what? Doing this again? Uh, so if you have a T-structure that can act as a primer mm -hmm. for the strand displacement, then why uh, go through and use Rep78 just to make the T-structure all over again and then start saying? Look, so if you, don't, if you don't nick it and copy to the end, you will lose the T-structure. It won't be present because it's only on one strand here. 
So you can see that if you, if you look at this, uh, this, when you nick it and stretch it out, it would just be blue. It would be single-stranded here. This wouldn't be filled in. So that wouldn't be a fully double-stranded genome, and you couldn't replicate any more past that. So that's why you have to do that. So the nicking is essential for getting the end of the DNA copy. Remember, you have to copy end to end without the loss of sequence. Okay, so that's parvovirus DNA. Yes? The parvo DNA is single stranded, and the ends can form these T structures, which are, you know, they're a little bit of double stranded structure. Yes? Previous, yes. Mm -hmm. So the, the single strand that forms the, the T structure. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. So let's move to a double-stranded DNA genome. Adenovirus is slightly bigger now than what we've been talking about. Uh, you remember adenovirus is this unusual uh, icosahedral particle with the fibers at each five-fold axis. The long double-stranded DNA is packaged inside. There's an origin at either end. So I, I forgot to tell you that in the... Um, parvovirus DNA, this is the origin, the, the three prime end, the, this T structure with the three prime hydroxyl, that's the origin of replication basically because that's where DNA synthesis begins. You can see it was labeled here. Here there's an origin at either end. And again, all that means is that's where DNA synthesis begins. So adenovirus has two origins of replication. DNA replication occurs by strand displacement and uh, it's semi-conservative, which all of this is. Uh, so let's see how this happens. This is unusual because the primer is a protein linked to a C residue. And that's the primer, and that's shown here. So here is the double-stranded uh, DNA genome. As it is packaged in the virus particle, it actually has a protein uh, linked to each 5 prime end. That's these uh, orange blobs here, because those are left over from DNA priming. So DNA replication begins at one end, and of course we're going to begin at the three prime end here. And what happens is a polymerase molecule, this is a viral polymerase. Adenovirus encodes its own polymerase and a bunch of other proteins that it needs for DNA replication also. So the ad polymerase uh, complexes with a protein called PTP, which is preterminal protein. So this protein on the ends of the genome is, is called terminal protein. And there's a precursor of it that binds the polymerase and is linked via a serine residue on the preterminal protein to a C, a CTP that the enzyme picks up. Uh, and this all happens in a complex at the three prime end of the genome. That C happens to be complementary to the first G at the three prime end of the viral DNA. That is the primer for DNA replication. You see they've got the polymerase already there. It's bound to the terminal protein. Uh, and then it begins to copy uh, this bottom strand. And this is by strand displacement. So now here we've seen the polymerase has made some red new DNA. It's moving along. It's displacing the top strand. This is displacement synthesis. As the top strand is displaced, a viral single-stranded DNA binding protein, DBP, uh, binds the single strand to keep it single-stranded, stop it from snapping back on the template. And eventually, when the polymerase completes copying uh, this bottom strand, uh, the product is this molecule here, the red and the light blue one. See, that's part three. Uh, and then you have left the displaced single-stranded DNA, which, uh, whose ends uh, form a, um, what we call a panhandle. It's basically a short base-paired region. So we have a three-prime end and a five-prime end. And this looks very much to the DNA polymerase like the original genome. So this is an origin of replication. And so the polymerase, together with a preterminal protein, initiates DNA synthesis at the three prime end right there. You can see it's elongating. As it goes, it's knocking off the single-stranded DNA binding proteins. And so that gives you another double-stranded DNA. So both strands have been copied. It's semi-conservative replication. The first one, well, they're both by Technically, this one is by strand displacement, and this is just by copying. There's no strand to displace on this one. Two different. These are the two daughter molecules then. And then finally, the preterminal protein is cleaved by a protease to give you the final um, 
terminal protein, which is on the viral DNA. So that's uh, how the DNA replicates. Again, the virus encodes a lot of its own proteins, including DNA polymerase. Yes? PDP is brought in the particle or synthesized from the DNA when so a terminal protein is brought in the particle, but that's not useful as a primer. The PTP has to be synthesized, as does the viral polymerase. So again, this DNA has to get in the nucleus, it has to be transcribed, and you have to make DNA polymerase, pre-terminal protein, and a few other proteins that you need in order to replicate. And here, there is no end problem. Okay, the, the, the way it's solved here is by priming right at the end. So the protein allows the polymerase to recognize the end, so you don't need a primer. So that's just another way to solve that end problem. See, if you start right at the end, you don't need a DNA primer or an RNA primer. All right, this is just a cartoon of the single-stranded DNA binding protein uh, binding to the single strand. Here's the polymerase. It's making a new strand, copying the bottom strand of the viral DNA, and it's displacing the top strand, it's strand displacement, and as single-stranded regions are exposed, the DNA binding protein is binding. And again, these are both viral proteins. Okay. Now, how is DNA replication of parvovirus and adenovirus similar? Okay, number two seems to be winning here and a little bit of number five, which was none of the above. So let's take a look at that. How are they similar? They both require protein-linked primers. <coughs> Only adenovirus requires a protein-linked primer. Uh, replication occurs uh, by strand displacement. DNA, that's correct. Uh, DNA synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm. This is not correct. These are both in the nucleus uh, and a replication fork occurs in both. Let's see what the answer was again for you guys. Did number <coughs> two, which is right, and a little bit of number 11, sorry, <laughs> number five, none of the above. So it's number two. All right, so those are the main types of genomes that we're going to talk about. I want to go a little bit into detail about a few features of DNA replication. One of them is origins of replication. We've talked a little bit about what they are, uh, and these are uh, in the various genomes. There's one in the SV40, one uh, in the parvovirus, two in the adenovirus genome, and herpes virus, which we haven't talked about, has three origins of replication, two ORI S's and one ORI L. So all you need to know is that there could be one or multiple origins of replications in viral DNA genomes. These are typically AT-rich segments. They're AT rich because those are easy to melt than a GC rich. GC bonds are, are stronger than AT bonds. Uh, they seed the assembly of multi-protein complexes. So, for example, T antigen will come in and then that brings in a number of other proteins all seeding the origin. And as I said, some have one and others, as, as far as we know, there are uh, three is the maximum, but these Mimi and Pandora viruses may well have more origins. Of course, we have many, many origins in our chromosomes to accommodate the replication of very, very large DNAs. These are some uh, viral origins of replication, SV40, herpes, the Oriel, and adenovirus, just to show you some common features. So they all have AT-rich elements. You can see their kind of gray color here and here and here. And again, that facilitates melting of the template. AT is easier to melt than GC. There are lots of repeat sequences. These are these sequences with the arrow, and these are typically uh, binding sites for large T or related origin binding proteins. And they also tend to be right next to transcriptional regulatory sequences. Uh, so you can see here, um, there's an enhancer in the SV40 and an SP1 binding site. This is a transcription protein right next to the uh, origin in the, uh, in the herpes virus origin, there are promoters, those are the red arrows, uh, and there are also transcription factor binding sequences near the adenovirus origin. And this is because they share activities, so some of these origin binding proteins are also transcriptional activators, so they have multifunctions. Uh, so the T antigen, for example, not only binds the origin, but it also stimulates transcription uh, from a nearby promoter. So the 
linkage of transcription and origin is, is on purpose because you, the uh, proteins can share activities. So some of the origin recognition proteins, we've talked about polyomavirus uh, T antigen. Uh, the related papillomaviruses, it's called E1, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, E1 doesn't bind very well by itself. It needs a second viral protein called E2. Uh, parvovirus, the rep protein, is the origin binding protein. We've talked about ha how that works. Uh, and for adenovirus, the PTP is the origin binding protein that recruits the polymerase. And then there's a herpes viral protein as well. Just to show you that there are th these proteins have very similar functions in recruiting polymerase and accessory proteins uh, to the origin. So here is uh, SP40 large T antigen. Just to show you that this is an amazing protein. You don't, you don't need to remember any of the details here except that it can do a lot of different things. Okay, so for example, here, well, here is the origin binding sequence of the protein. So these are the amino acids that interact with the origin. It's got helicase activity, which you can see here, single-stranded DNA binding activity. Here's a part of the protein that binds polymerase alpha. So that's the primase, right? It recruits it by binding to this specific region. So that's how the cell gets tricked into replicating SV40 DNA. T antigen binds specifically, it's a viral protein, and then it brings in Paul alpha. Uh, and then there are lots of other domains here. As you can see, there are sites for phosphorylation. So the activities of these proteins can be regulated by phosphorylation. Uh, there is also a sequence here that controls the host range of this protein. So T, T antigen is, is species specific. So if you take a polyoma from a monkey, it will only bind uh, it will only work in a monkey cell and not in a mouse or a <coughs> hamster cell. And that's because these T antigens will not interact with the alpha polymerase from the wrong species. So that keeps the viruses from replicating in the right species. Uh, the other interesting protein or binding site is here. It's labeled as RB. This is the retinoblastoma protein. And this is, RB is a major cell cycle regulator. We'll talk about that in a moment and it is bound by T antigen, which sequesters it and makes the cells keep dividing. As we'll see, viruses, DNA viruses do not like to infect non-dividing cells, and they all encode proteins that <coughs> nudge the cells uh, into dividing, and that's the binding site on T antigen for RB. So here's how T antigen binds SV40. We've talked about this. Uh, two hexamers of T antigen bind the origin and recruit proteins, melt it, initiate DNA replication. The same happens for the papillomaviruses. On the right is the origin of replication of bovine papillomavirus. This is the same topology genome, double-stranded circle. The point here is that you need two proteins. The E1 is the actual functional T antigen, if you will, but it doesn't bind very well. It needs E2 to help it bind with high affinity. As soon as E2 deposits E1, then it multimerizes and is able to denature the origin, and it recruits replication proteins, just as T antigen does. So the point here is that these T antigens bind the origin and help recruit uh, proteins that you need for replication. Uh, herpes virus is an even larger virus, um, and uh, it has two ORIs and a unique ORIL, so two ORIS's and one ORIL. These are believed to be functional during lytic versus latent infection, which we will talk about later. Um, this DNA enters the cell as a linear molecule. So these virions dock onto the nuclear pore. The DNA goes through the portal into the nucleus. Uh, and then it uh, converts to a circle and replicates as a rolling circle. So I wanted to show you how this works because this is a kind of a neat sequence. Here's the herpes virus uh, DNA. As it gets in the nucleus, it's circularized. The enzyme that does that is a cellular enzyme. It's a DNA ligase called XRCC4. And uh, so this DNA just comes in, it's, it's ligated, and then uh, it um, will undergo rolling circle replication. But before it can do that, it has to be transcribed and at least one protein has to be made. In the case of herpes, many proteins are made because it makes quite a lot of the replication machinery. But again, the DNA doesn't just start replicating, it has to be transcribed so it happens later. So the, the circular DNA is nicked um, by an endonuclease, uh, and then the 3' end that's made as a consequence of the nick 
uh, is, serves as a primer for DNA replication. You get continuous DNA synthesis in a five to three prime direction. And as this DNA elongates, then the piece uh, that was removed or nicked at the five prime end can be copied by discontinuous DNA synthesis, right? So the synthesis has to go five to three prime. Um, and here you eventually are making double-stranded molecules. You can see here uh, is the original blue with the discontinuous DNA. Uh, and eventually, see this, this DNA has no end problem. Uh, neither does this one. And this circle just keeps move, just cranking out genome length pieces. Uh, these are eventually clipped as they go in the virion. And we'll talk later how the portal actually has an endonuclease that clips genome length DNAs as they enter the particle. Now eventually at the other end you would have a five prime end problem, but that would only be one. You can still crank out many, many, many viral unit lengths without having a five prime end problem. So that's rolling circle replication. So don't confuse it with rolling rock, which is nowhere near as elegant as this. <laughs> All right, so these are some of the viral proteins that herpes makes. Not for you to memorize the names, but just to know that it makes uh, primase. That is the enzyme that makes RNA primers and um, Okazaki fragments. Processivity protein that makes DNA replication continue for long periods of time and origin binding protein, a single-stranded DNA binding protein and its own DNA polymerase. So this virus makes a lot of the components uh, for replicating its DNA. And that brings us to pox virus, which um, is the one virus we're talking about that replicates in the cytoplasm. And because it does, it's had to make its own DNA synthesis machinery. It's not gonna find any of the host cell DNA replication proteins uh, in the cytoplasm. Uh, so this uh, viral DNA, when it enters the cell, it gets put in the cytoplasm but it still has to make the proteins to replicate its genome. So DNA synthesis doesn't occur immediately. The virus doesn't bring them in with the particle. But interestingly, the virus brings in an RNA polymerase and everything it needs to make mRNAs right in the cytoplasm. So it can make its mRNAs, translate them, make the DNA polymerase that it needs to replicate this genome. Now this genome topology is unusual, so let's see how uh, that's replicated. So these, this is an experiment showing you where pox virus DNA replication occurs. These are immunofluorescent photographs. On the left, we're staining for DNA. So you can see the cell nucleus, of course, uh, has DNA. You can see DNA in the cytoplasm uh, as well. So this is a pox virus infected cell. The second panel is stained for DNA binding protein. It's one of the proteins needed to replicate uh, the genome. You can see it's, it's cytoplasmic only, not in the nucleus. And if you merge these two colors, you see that these are the sites of viral DNA replication in the cytoplasm. So those are called factories. That's where the virus sets up shop and makes more uh, virus particles. Now because this DNA has covalently linked ends, it has to be nicked in order to be replicated. So a viral protein nicks uh, one end. This is after the DNA has been transcribed, the mRNAs have been made, proteins have been made. Uh, one end is nicked and then this gap is filled in, as you can see here. Uh, it then folds, refolds into a hairpin to, to look just like the original one. And that three prime end serves as a primer for DNA synthesis. So now the polymerase extends the three prime end. Uh, it eventually goes all the way to the other end, right here, then goes around it and goes all the way uh, back on the upper strand. So now you have two molecules that are linked and these have to be nicked by a viral endonuclease to resolve uh, the two strands. So this gives you two uh, molecules from the original one. So that, that is how DNA replication occurs. You maintain the terminal structures and of course the nicks are sealed by uh, a ligase. So pretty neat solution to the problem. And these are all the, some of the proteins that the virus encodes. These are just again to give you an idea of what's needed when you have to set up a DNA replication center in the cytoplasm. You don't have any help from the cell. These are more proteins than the herpes viruses encode. Uh, proteins involved in DNA replication, repair, and recombination. And then uh, proteins needed for nucleotide metabolism to make the DNTPs uh, that you need to replicate the genome. All right, question. What makes poxvirus DNA replication different from all of the other viruses we discussed today? 
Looks like number one is the most and a little bit of number four, none of the above. All right, number one, of course, the complete machinery is encoded by the viral genome. Complete is the key because the others only encoded part of it. Uh, DNA synthesis occurs in the nucleus. That's not true. Cells in the cytoplasm. DNA synthesis occurs by strand displacement. That's true for pox, but it doesn't make it unique. Um, so, and uh, maybe some of you selected none of the above because you're confused about number one, but I want to distinguish that pox is different because it makes everything it needs to work, work in the cytoplasm to replicate its DNA. The other viruses, adeno and herpes, make a lot, but they don't make all the proteins. They still need something from the cell, whereas pox does not. All right, the, the um, last top, yes? Why does it need to be the host cell? Why does pox virus need the host cell at all? Okay, so the question is, is a good one. Why does pox virus need the host cell? Well, it can replicate its DNA, but it can't make energy. It can't make membranes. It can't. What is one thing I've missed? It, yeah, it can't make protein. It, it doesn't have a translation system. All the reasons why these are uh, obligate parasites. Yeah. Um, between steps three and four with the pox virus. Pox, yeah. Um, so you, you've got. On the left-hand side there, all those nucleotides are bound at three. And going to four, it, it doesn't seem like it's thermodynamically favorable because you have less molecules bound. What, is, there, is there a protein involved? All right, so you're worried about the thermo... No, no, between three. Sorry. The, the three, three and four? Three, yeah, those two. So what happens here is that... Um, so you're, you're worried that this is going to be folding up here and blocking this? Well, that's... I mean, at that... At, at, at that step, right after step two, yeah. it's 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 filled to the end, right? So they're all they're right. all base paired. So base there are viral so there are viral proteins that denature that for sure. Oh, so another protein. Absolutely, yeah, oh, okay. yeah. Right. This is an oversimplification. There are certain, okay. sort of like the uh, parvovirus genome, where the the rep protein denatures the end so that the polymerase can work. Absolutely, yeah. <coughs> all right. So I want to talk about regulation of DNA synthesis. This is an important topic, and here's the key. Most most of the cells in your body are not dividing at any given time. And viruses don't like that. They like to be in, especially DNA viruses, they like to be in dividing cells because they need the replication proteins for most of the viruses we're talked about. So what viruses do is they, inho they induce host replication proteins. And this is often done by uh, proteins that are made by virus early on in the replication cycle to get the cells going so they're ready to replicate their DNA. And this is really interesting. Is, is this going to have relevance to transformation and oncogenesis later on? So we have to look at the cell cycle, which I know you all know very well. Uh, it's shown here as a diagram, the classic diagram showing the mitosis phase, followed by G1, the synthesis phase, and then G2. Uh, so again, most cells are not dividing. They're not in M. And uh, many of them are restricted at this restriction point, which, which prevents them from going into the S phase by a protein called RB, retinoblastoma protein. This was originally um, identified in kids with retinal tumors, the loss of this gene causes the formation of tumors. So this is a tumor suppressor gene because its presence prevents the development of tumors. We will see later other genes, their presence cause the development of tumors. This is the difference. This is a negative regulator that suppresses tumor formation. This is a regulator of the cell cycle that keeps most cells in us resting. Viruses do not, for the most part, like the RB protein. So they try and get around it. They want the cells to be dividing. And now here is one way that that's done. The RB protein blocks the transcriptional activity of genes that are needed for cell division and proceeding through the cell cycle. So here, this uh, red arrow is meant to indicate a bunch of different mRNAs whose protein products are needed for the cells to divide. Now, normally you need two transcription proteins bound near these promoters, they're called E2F and DP, to get the synthesis of these proteins. Now, RB regulates these proteins and therefore regulates the cell cycle. Normally, RB is present as in a complex with these two transcription proteins, E2F and DP, and although they can bind these promoter sequences, the uh, transcription is inhibited by the presence of RB. So in other words, the way RB works as a checkpoint protein 
to block the cells from going through the cell cycle. It represses the genes that are needed to get through cell synthesis and division. All right, okay so far? It's a simplified explanation, but it will do. RB controls the cell cycle by acting at promoters for genes that are needed for DNA synthesis and passing through the cell cycle. RB is a target of the large T antigen of SV40, uh, the, the similar antigens of human papillomavirus, they're called E7, and a protein of adenovirus called E1A. Uh, they're shown as purple proteins here. They bind RB and they sequester it so that all of these genes are activated. So when SV40 or HPVs or adenoviruses infect the cell, they sequester RB through their T antigens, and it's the first protein that they make, right? And that allows the cells to, be in, to divide, because the virus, when a cell is dividing, it's making DNA replication proteins, which is what the virus needs. So this is how the virus kicks a, a, an otherwise resting cell into dividing. When a virus infects you, it doesn't know what cells are dividing which are not. It just goes into a cell and if it's not dividing it will kick it into dividing and do this. So this is a really interesting um, mechanism. We're going to come back to this when we talk about virus mediated tumor formation because it plays a big role in that. All right now two more concepts. In some cases viral DNA replication needs to be low and in other cases it needs to be high. Okay, we're going to talk uh, uh, in a few weeks about latent infections by various viruses. Uh, in cells that are latently infected, very few or no viruses are produced, and there's just a little bit of viral DNA present. So the origins don't have to be so active in these cells. And then when you switch to a productive cycle, which is called the lytic cycle, you have to make more virions. Then we have to go into exponential DNA synthesis. You have to make a lot of virus particles, so you need a lot of DNA. So you need to be able to regulate how much DNA is made. This is typically through the origin of replication. So for example, Epstein-Barr virus is a herpes virus. You all have it. It is latent in you. You have genomes of this virus. They're just replicating very slowly, okay? <laughs> They're there, I guarantee it. And that's controlled by one of the origins, or P origin for plasmid maintenance, because the viral genome is maintained as a plasmid, an episomal DNA in your cells. When EBV starts to replicate and produce virions, and that's how you transmit it to someone else, it goes to another promoter, which is called the OREL, the origin for lytic synthesis. And this can churn out lots and lots of DNAs to make more virions. Okay, so that's an example of a virus that uses two origins. There are others that use one origin. Human papillomaviruses, the agents of warts. They have one origin for both high and low replication. And whether it's high or low depends on the cellular environment that the virus is in. So I'm gonna show you examples of these two. First, uh, EBV. So don't get scared by this slide. Don't, you don't have to memorize it. You just need to know this idea of how this one, promote, uh, this one origin of EBV is controlled so it only fires once per cell cycle. Every time a cell divides, the viral DNA replicates once. So you put one DNA in each of the two cells. It doesn't have to fire 50 or 100 or 1,000 times. It would be a waste because it's not making virus particles. The way it does this is by coordinating the origin binding proteins with the cell cycle. So the origin of the viral DNA is buried under this protein complex made up of ORC, CDC6, CDT1. Names are not important. A couple of cellular proteins whose activities are regulated with the cell cycle. This origin binding complex can only form in the G1 phase of the cell cycle because that's when these proteins are available. They're not available any other time. And then as the cell moves through S, the DNA is replicating. You can see a replication fork here. And then by the time the DNA is replicated, we're back to the top of the cell cycle. It can only replicate once because it's pretty slow. Uh, and then if it tried, but if it tried to replicate more than one time, these proteins would not be available at any other time. They would not be available in S or G2 or M. They're only available in G1. The reasons are complicated. For example, uh, this uh, CDC6 protein is degraded 
in the S and G2 phases. So if there's any free protein around, that's gone. Uh, this other one here called MCM, which is very important to bind at the origin, uh, this is phosphorylated in G2, and it's shipped out of the nucleus, so it's not available for the virus. Uh, this other protein here, the blue one, which helps uh, get CDT1 in, uh, this is degraded. So again, the key here is the only time these origin binding proteins will form is in G1. So this viral DNA replicates once per cell cycle. And that's enough to maintain the plasmid, and that's what's happening in you at this very moment. This slide is happening in all of you, okay? And um, I, I think that's pretty neat that we, this is happening and we can't even sense it, of course. And then at some point when um, it, the virus is reactivated and needs to make thousands and thousands of DNAs, it switches to a different origin of replication. Okay, one more example. This is the human papillomavirus. These are viruses that infect uh, epithelia, mucosal layers, mouth, anogenital tract. They cause warts. Now what happens is the virus infects the lowest level of cells. So this is a layer of skin. You have dead skin on top. The highly differentiated skin cells are at the top, and then as you move down, they become less and less differentiated until all the way at the bottom are the precursor skin cells. So the virus initially infects these precursor skin cells. You typically acquire an infection when you have some damage to your mucosa. You get a laceration or uh, a scarring of some kind. Virus gets into these cells. You initially have uh, limited amplification. About 50 copies are produced, but then uh, it's, it goes into what's called maintenance replication, where you have very few copies of DNA per cell, just enough to keep the viral DNA present. As these cells mature, so what happens is the precursor skin cells start to mature and they move up and eventually will be forming the upper layers of the skin and then eventually they die, of course, and uh, slough off. And this is a good way to spread the virus to others, by the way. Uh, and, you know, the room is full of this white dust, which is your skin, so it's full of human papillomaviruses. Um, as the cells mature, as they differentiate, the viral DNA replication cranks up until you get thousands and thousands of genomes per cell in these top layers, and that's, of course, when it wants to make virus particles. So this is controlled by one origin. The virus only has one origin, and the cell proteins that are present and change from from the undifferentiated to the differentiated cells control this. So that's, that's another cool mechanism. All right, our last uh, question. Which of the following is known to be a factor in controlling the level of viral DNA synthesis? I hope you picked all of the above because that's in fact what it is. It's all the things I just told you, different origins, the phase of the cell cycle, tumor suppressor gene, and a single origin of replication. That are, those are all ways to regulate uh, viral DNA synthesis.